Yeah, we do. Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to Freshwater Ministries. Amen. Everybody's still eating yet. That's why we're starting late. Just bring it on down, yeah. Amen. So, you all missed out on the really good sandwiches and, and some potato salad. And now they're eating another sandwich. It's called an ice cream sandwich. You see, you missed out. Amen. Hallelujah. That's good. Thank you. Amen. So we're honored to have you with us today. Amen. We, you know, I said we're getting started a little bit late. I hope you uh, tune in. I, I did post it and let people know that we were starting late. So I just uh, uh, didn't want to eat before because we didn't want to eat late at night or, or later. Um, I thought, you know, we could eat before and take a little fellowship together. Uh, we say hi to uh, Bishop Black and First Lady. Um, they couldn't make it tonight. And then we say, we say hi to TJ. Hallelujah. And Helen. Amen. And I hope that uh, Brother Chauncey is watching. I was hoping he'd show up. Uh, but amen. You know, God is good. Amen. So tonight we have a we have a very familiar topic because I felt we need to help people and, and I hope that uh, Pastor Cora went it and Pastor Crystal is able to watch. Amen. Um, one more thing, I'm, I'm trying to get all everything all connected up here, so please bear with me just for a moment. Hallelujah. There you are. I see myself. Oh boy, I need help. <laughs> I need help. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Good. Turn this down. There's always a time delay. Amen. Once again, welcome to Freshwater Ministry. I'm going to ask Bishop Bob to uh, pray us in. <coughs> Our Father, we thank you this evening <coughs> for the privilege that we have to sit around the table, not only to eat natural food, but also to enjoy spiritual food that we always receive when we look into the Word of God, the bread of life, that which teaches us how to serve God in a better way. I ask that you will bless those that will be tuning in to this broadcast this evening. We pray for Pastor Nels, Pastor Cox, Sister Cox, other members of the church, Sister Laura that's here, Laura that's here with us this evening. We pray for others who may be on their way. And God, this evening, as we look into your word, we're reminded of many that may be international watching. Yes. Because we know that they watch from Pakistan and sometimes Burma from India. We bless them <laughs> and others in Africa that may be watching. We pray for America this evening, Lord. We're in a very state of confusion in this country, and you're the only one yes, that can Lord. pull us out of the of the terrible mess that that we're in right now. So we pray for our nation. We pray for the leadership. Who, who respect you, God, and others who despise you. We pray that you will touch their hearts and bring them into a proper relationship with the only God that there is, the Lord yes. Jesus Christ. Yes. Now bless the word as we open it up. Bless our leader and our teacher this evening as Pastor Cox directs this next hour of discovery. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. There is no confusion in who Jesus is. The only confusion is with those who are ignorant and unwilling to find out who he is. Many people make up different stories about him. I've been catching some of these, these Muslims and, and Indians and, and Pakistanis that, that are that are you know, Shiites and, and Sunnis and I mean all of these all these people saying things about Christianity. 
about followers of Christ. So you know more than more than uh, um, more than Christianity, I'm a follower of Christ. Uh, we use the word Christianity because it was given to us and we adopted it as followers of Christ. But I, 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 uh, I'm kind of, like I said, I'm always a lone wolf. <laughs> I'm a little bit different than a lot of people. I don't do the traditional things uh, like some people do. And, you know, it's okay that they do it. You know, I'm not, I'm not knocking what they're doing. I'm just trying to do what the Bible tells me to do. And that's how I try to teach. So there is no confusion in Jesus. The only confusion is man. <clears throat> man makes a lot of confusions, a lot of, a lot of uh, mistakes, a lot of problems, um, creating uh, heresies. Uh, um, let's go here for him. These scriptures are all scriptures that that um, that we're going to kind of use during this time. Amen. And you'll find a familiar theme in these scriptures. I would like to start off with Colossians two nine. Yes. Yeah, yeah. These are no specific order. Okay? <coughs> these are really in no order whatsoever. I had a, a sheet of, of scriptures that I wanted to, and I, this is what I'm using. But actually, I'm going from my notes. So it's Colossians two nine. <laughs> I'll give you a moment to get there, and we'll sing while you're there. D D D D D D. Oh. <laughs> Okay. I need to put a little light bulb in there. <clears throat> Colossians 2 9. What does Colossians 2 9 say in your Bible here, Bishop? <clears throat> For in him is embodied all the fullness of the Godhead. Now that's taken from the ancient Eastern text, right? Out of the Aramaic language. Have you got King James there? I have uh, uh, the Aramaic. I mean, I have the NASB. I have the King James too. Colossians two nine. I know what it says. Yeah. And two nine says Colossians chapter two. Verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness yes. of the Godhead bodily. Yeah. Which is a very familiar scripture. To right. Oneness people. That's, the, that's the King James Bible. Uh, we, we use so many different Bibles here. The reason we use so many Bibles is so that we can get a clear understanding of the text. I prefer the King James. I use a Thompson chain advertisement. Okay. But I also love the NASB. And I think that's a wonderful Bible. And there's other Bibles out there that are, are, are wonderful. <coughs> you know, but there's sometimes, bless you, there's sometimes in the scripture when the King James says it so eloquently, there's other times when the NASB says it very eloquently. But they're both saying the same thing, just using different words to get there. You know, people criticize, well, you can go and use King James. Well, amen. You know, but if it's a tool that, that God has put in my hands, I'm going to use that tool. You know, you don't go out the, in the field to plow the field and leave the plow behind. You know, you take every tool that you can. So, as we go through the Bible today, what we're talking about is oneness. Okay, that there's only one God. That there's not three gods. That there's not five gods, ten gods. There's not, you know, we, we serve Yahweh. We, see, we serve Yeshua on the Shia who came, God came in the form of, of man and, took, and named Jesus. 
So let's go to, uh, um, let me see here. Go to Colossians 1, 15, 17. <laughs> I want to, uh, uh, now, as we go through Colossians here, you notice we're just in 2, 9. Now we're going to go to Colossians 1, 15, 17. First, or Colossians 1, 15, 17. Our first scripture was Colossians 2 9, in which we said, For in him was the fullness of the deity dwells in a bodily form. That's the NASB. Read that again. For in him all the fullness of the deity, okay, dwells in a bodily form. I like that. Yes. <clears throat> Colossians 1 15 17. Paul backs up here, or we back up to what Paul was speaking. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, and all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Everything that Christ is always points back to him being God. I don't care what scripture you read, if you put things in the context, it points back to him <clears throat> being God. The reason that people don't see it is because the, the, the ruler of this world has blinded them to the truth. The one thing is I one thing I do admire about the tenacity of the of the of the Muslims is they believe one God, Allah. And we shouldn't criticize the name of Allah. Okay? Their belief pattern is wrong, but in Aramaic, the name for God, guess what? It's Allah. And Jesus spoke Aramaic. So in the interpretations here, when we hear the word Allah, they're talking about God. It's just that they have twisted who God is, and many the Muslims have twisted who God is, and, and created him in their own image and their own likeness, the way that they want to see him. And that's not who, who God is. Our God is the one who Jesus went to the cross, died, and was resurrected. In the Muslim language, in, in, in religion, Jesus never was crucified. He was never <clears throat> crucified. Now I'm only using this comparison just for a brief moment because many of our today fellow Christians or people who call themselves Christians, um, they also deny the truth. Uh, we have, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call them out, I'm sorry. We have the Mormons who say that Jesus is the brother of Satan. Half, half, brother. half brother of Satan. Okay? We have the Muslims which say that he, Jesus was only a prophet and therefore he cannot be God. And then we have the, the uh, Seventh day Adventists, I mean, the Seventh day Adventists, excuse me, excuse me, I'm sorry. We have the Mormons, like, like I said. They believe that God came out of man and he came and, and became God. He was a man first and he became God. So there's many different beliefs in, in what, they, what, they, what they believe, but we believe the apostles, their teaching, the apostolic truth, that there's only one God, okay? <coughs> that he was Yahweh in the Old Testament, and here in the New Testament, his name is Jesus. And this one God is uncreated, self-sustaining, and he is eternal. Yes. Has no 
beginning or no end. No end. No yeah. end. But it's important that we bring out the fact that the God the Bible talks about is uncreated and he sustains himself. Right. He's, he lives outside of the time continuum. Right. And he knows, and we brought, you brought this up before, he knows the end from the beginning. Right. <laughs> he already knows. He knew it, he knows it, and he already knew it. Right. He already knew what he now knows. Yep. And he knows what he's going to know because he already knew it. <laughs> right. That's it. Exactly. I mean, that's just the God that we serve. That's, that's exactly. And he's not confused. Never. No. Okay? That's what the, by the title we have. He's not confused. No, only, only, only we are confused because we don't have, we lack understanding. We're ignorant to the things of God. I think that you know it's it's important to understand or grab hold of the idea. Praise the Lord, uh, uh, brother Edwin, Minister Edwin. Lord bless you, sir. Um, it's important that we that we understand that how important the oneness of God is. Mm -hmm. Because if we if we miss that mark, if we miss that that point, we can miss our whole salvation. Paul told the Galatians that if you believe another gospel, which is not the gospel, right, it will lead you into error. And error Repent. means we trespass, and trespassing is a sin. Correct. And so it becomes very important what we believe. Amen. You know, there are those that say, I, I believe in God, but I'm not going to I'm not going to get too involved in all of the ramifications of believing in God. Right. But it's the ramifications that mess us up. No, they don't they don't want to get involved in the details. Exactly. They want to serve a general God that, okay, you know, I say, yeah, I come to church, I go to church, I worship, yeah, you know, and on Tuesday night, sometimes I'll go, or Wednesday night, whatever, I'll go, and then, um, you know, but I want him to leave me alone the rest of the time. The devil doesn't care if we believe in God. He doesn't. He gets upset when we decide to serve him and follow him. Right, exactly, exactly. And the reason that Jesus came was precisely about that, because we were unable to recognize or make up our mind between good and evil. So he came and presented himself as the answer to all the evil that was going on in the world. Yes. As a response to that. Look at uh, 1 Peter uh, uh, 2.24. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not on the list? No. No. It's that's not. why I'm getting confused. He gets a whole list of scriptures. Well, these are just, all these are is one of the scriptures. I know. Okay. I, I, I so, that you, so people can look at them later on and. and oh, and, so these weren't necessarily meant for today? No, they're just, just a guideline for me. That's First all. Peter 1. One, or, yeah, First Peter 2.24. You see, Jesus had to come to, to rectify us, to redeem us, to restore us to our right thinking. Our minds were messed up. It had been, we had been deceived from the time of Adam, and, and we had always waxed worse and worse without God. That's why the world is so crazy, because it's waxing worse and worse without God in their life. So, 1 Peter 2.24, excuse me here, says... And he himself bore our sins and his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live in the righteousness by, for by his wounds you were healed. The importance of it, bringing out the scripture here is going along with just what I was saying. We had to, he had to come to redeem us. He had to come to restore us. He had to come to show us that good could triumph over evil. You know, there was a, 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 I don't know if you remember Bishop, a, a, a gentleman by the name of Carmen? Yeah, a singer. Yeah. Uh, he's gone on to be the Lord. Right. But uh, um, he had a song, uh, 
uh, where he, Jesus was fighting the devil. Mm -hmm. Okay. The and, huh? It was called the champion. The champion, yep. And when he got down to the end of it and, and the devil had knocked Jesus down and killed him, right? And then Jesus talks to God and says, okay, now look what's going on here. I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember this exactly. And God, he said, well, where's, where's the countdown? And, he, and so God started counting 10, 9, and he counted backwards. Usually you count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay? God started counting down back, backwards from 10 to 1. So when he got to 1, Jesus rose. That's how the devil can't see the end from the beginning. All he can see is what's in front of him at the moment. And so when, when God started counting down backwards, he panicked because he didn't understand what was going on. People in the world do not understand what's going on and they're going to start panicking pretty soon. And the reason, to, to even expand on your statement, the reason the devil doesn't know what's going on, except what he sees immediately, is because he's not omniscient. Right. He's not omnipresent and he's not omnipotent. Those three characteristics are qualification exclusively to God. Yes. Yes. Omniscient. Knows all. I'm not present everywhere at once. Right. Omnipotent. King of kings. Amen. Now, Lori, you were a baby, an infant. Okay. Then you became a mother. And now you're a grandmother. All three of those things are important phases in your life. But God knew every single phase that you're going through. He knows the end from the beginning and the, and the end is far greater for you because you're following after him. So that's why uh, people get restored in relationships. That's why people um, get strong and healthy, you know, or, or God just blesses them in one way or another in their lives because he wants only good for us, you know, and the, and the world would rather see us come to the altar every single Sunday complaining about the same thing over and over again. One of the reasons that uh, Freshwater Ministries does not have a lot of altar calls is because people will come and they will come the next week and they will come the next week and they will come the next week about the same reason. Though they got prayed for by me or by Pastor Evelyn or, or Pastor Christo or Corwin, whoever, okay, prayed for them, they keep coming because of their unbelief that God is able. The Bible says that God is able to do exceedingly above all that we may think or ask. So when we ask something from God, and this goes for everybody that's watching, you know, I'm just talking to Lori's right here, so I'm talking to her as, as your representative, okay? Um, when you receive a word from the Lord saying that you are healed, then you have a choice in your life to make. You're either going to believe or you're not going to believe. Those who not, don't believe, guess what? They come back to the altar the next week, all right? Those who trust in the Lord don't come back to the altar because they're, they're going to trust. Now, does God heal everything instantaneously? No. Sometimes it's a miracle and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a process that we go through to get there because he's trying to teach us something. He's trying to show us something. He's showing his, us his glory. That look, at the doctors can't do it and... and I always, I always remember the story of the woman with the issue of blood. Okay? 12 years that she had an issue. 12 years she went to the doctors, she went everywhere, <clears throat> doing everything, spent all of her wealth. Okay? And then, after all of that, then she heard about Jesus coming. And you've heard me preach that sermon. So, so you know, she went to Jesus. When she made that decision, it was her final decision. Because she wasn't going to turn around and go back another way. She got to the hem of his garment, touched it, and, and, and was healed. This is where people walk by faith and not by sight. We can walk by faith and trust and believe God, or we can walk by sight 
and say that the, the problem or the situation is still visible to us, is still in our bodies. We're, we're denying the power of God. But we're saying, oh, I love Jesus. I'm, you know, I'm going to believe Jesus, you know. And then they, they, they stumble, okay? Now, at the same time, I'm going to say this to everybody. I, I don't want to be discouraged about coming to the altar, but come faith believing, okay? Believing that you will receive what God has for you. Now, I know I got a little sidetracked from the one that's teaching at this moment because I'm letting Bishop catch up. He, he's going through all of his, <laughs> all the scriptures here, all right? Um, but I felt this was important to talk to the people. I'm, I'm listening. You know, oh yeah, I know. But to talk to the people and talk to you and talk to my, my wife and everybody that can hear because we walk by faith and not by sight. So sometimes it, come, it comes really hard sometimes. You know, when, when that back is hurting or that headache is going, it's hard just to say, Lord, take the wheel. You know, and that's what he's trying to train us to do. He's trying to train us to, to allow him to take the reins of our life, to hold on to us, to be the Lord and God of our lives. Amen. Turn to Colossians, back on track here. Colossians 1, 18 through 20. I don't think that's written down either. Oh. Hey, you know, I do what God tells me to do. 1, 19? <laughs> 1 18 okay. through 20. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm, cover I'm covering the basis on that one. <laughs> okay. okay. Amen. Colossians 1, 18 through 20. Hallelujah. And Lori, why don't you read this one? 18, 18 through 20? Yes, okay. ma'am. This is in the King James. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the uh, preeminence. Preeminence, yeah. Preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Amen. Amen. Now there's a key verse in here that, that I want to uh, reflect on. Um, for it was the Father's good pleasure. All right? Verse 19. All right? So if we looked at, if we went back and don't turn there, if we went back and looked at Colossians 2. 9, for in him was the fullness of the deity dwells in him bodily form. Okay? For in for him all the fullness, excuse me, I left out the word all. For in him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. We come down to verse 19, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to what dwell in him. That's how the NASB for all the fullness to dwell in him. So God predestinated the fullness of, of himself in the bodily form of Christ to dwell among us. People will say that's kind of ridiculous in a statement. But who do you pray to? Who do you pray to? My God. Okay. Who do you pray to? God. Okay. Who is the Father. Who is the Father. And he is the Son. He is the Son. And he is the Spirit. But he's not all he's not he's not separated. No. Okay. You cannot divide God. Right. He is indivisible. Right. I know you're leading up to something, but I want to bring out something in verse twenty. But sure. I don't want to interrupt what you were bringing out. No, that's okay. Go ahead. Then to me. This speaks so clearly in verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, referring to Jesus, by him, by him, to reconcile all things unto himself, not themselves. Right. And so Jesus, 
who is God, right? Now a man, without ceasing to be God, he's God is in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Now, if you're a true Trinitarian, you would almost have to say God is reconciling to themselves. That because would, they that, believe that there is a pantheon of gods in the heavens, yeah. three different gods. The difference between, and for anyone listening who may be a little confused, the difference between a oneness person, which we are, we are apostolic people, and Trinitarian people who are non-apostolic, is we believe in one God manifested, that's the key word, right. as Father in creation, Son in redemption, and the Holy Spirit in our daily lives. Say that one more time for them. The difference between, the difference that the Bible says between a Trinitarian, and by the word, the word Trinity is not even in the Bible. That word didn't even come into existence until about the third century of the church when Tertullian and, and a few other Greek philosophers began to infiltrate uh, the, the church that later became the Church of Rome. Uh, a Trinitarian person will tell you they believe in one God revealed in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The word person is a misnomer. The Bible says... Great is the mystery of godliness, and without controversy, God was manifest in flesh. So we apostolic people believe in one God manifest as Father in creation, the Son in redemption, and the Holy Spirit in emanation or living in our daily lives. Because there's only one God, and you cannot divide that God into persons. The only person of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that scripture is found in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, where it teaches us that Jesus Christ is the effulgence or the outshining, or one translation said, he is the person of the Father because God is a spirit. Right. And a spirit, a spirit has no form. So when we talk about God, we are refer when we talk about God, we're referring to when we talk about God who has arms and legs and stands and sits and speaks and hears, we're talking basically about the pre-incarnate Christ because God is a spirit. You can't see a spirit. And when God wanted to be seen, he incarnated, as you said, he incarnated himself into the seed of the woman. The Virgin Mary became pregnant with God and that baby that was born nine months later was born without sin. In fact, one reason we know that he is the son of God, Sister Laura, you're a, you're a parent. When, when, when you became impregnated with your husband's seed, who determined the blood type of your child? The father. The father determines the blood type. You're a mother. The father, your father. I'm a father. I have three biological children. I determine their blood type. God is perfect without sin. God determines the blood type that flows in the veins of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus didn't have to be born again. He's the firstborn of all creation. Right. But he doesn't say he was born again. Right. So Jesus Christ is absolutely unequivocally, without debate, God manifest in the flesh. Amen. Amen. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So here, here's the that, that comes from years of study of right? <laughs> Match the question. I'm going to direct it towards Bishop now. What do you say to those who say, "But Jesus prayed to the Father." What's the answer for them? I was, I was proofreading my manuscript this afternoon, and that's part of my manuscript, is God praying to God. All right, here's, here's the simple answer. And the, the key word here is anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic. 
God, the Eternal One, has become man without ceasing to be God. Right. And all during his 33 and a half years of his manhood, without ceasing to be God, Jesus himself was dependent on his Father. Right. And so the man Jesus is praying to God. It's not God praying right. to God. It's the man, right. the humanity, crying out to divinity. Right. Now, yes, divinity was in the man, but that's one, that, that's an introduction. Now, here's what, I pers here's what I believe. I don't know that I can necessarily... Let, let, me, let me interrupt you right there. Okay? Go ahead. Uh, 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 so this is an important point right here. Who's inside of you? Right now? Right now. The Lord Jesus Christ. So who are you praying to? The Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus prayed to God who was inside of him. There's no contradiction there. That's okay? Right. Yeah. He, he came in the form of man to show us to pray to the Father. The Father now dwells inside of us. And so therefore, because he dwells inside of us, when we pray, we're not praying to some spaceless entity, okay? We're praying to the Lord Savior that's inside of us. Yes. Okay? When the Trinitarians pray, and correct me if I think I'm wrong, if I'm wrong in this, when the Trinitarians in their mind pray, they're praying to an entity up there. Okay? And, and many of my Trinitarian friends have privately came to me saying, which one do I pray to? Uh -huh. Do I pray to the Father? Do I pray to the Son? Right. Oh, yeah. and, and, and if you believe there are three separate Beans. Corporal, corporal bodies of God in right. heaven. Here's a Father here, here's a Son here, here's the Holy Ghost here. Then, no wonder they're confused, but folks, in, in all sincerity, don't just take the preacher's word for it. If you notice, everything that we're quoting is coming straight from the book of God. Yes. Everything we believe can be verified by this book. Yes. Many off, many I hear many preachers oftentimes, they quote, they quote some Greek. Now, I mentioned Tertullian, but I didn't quote Tertullian. No. I said Tertullian was one of the original Trinitarian uh, uh, promoters because he was a Greek philosopher, and he was, he was involving the, the merging Christian philosophy, the Christian faith, into Greek philosophy, and that's where... So, that's where Roman Christianity got off on the wrong foot because it was impregnated by Greek philosophy. Right. Those of us who are Judeo Christians. Oh man. Come on, you're okay. All right. You see, the church began in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. 120 people. They were all Jews. Not in Rome? No, it didn't start in Rome. <laughs> it didn't start in Springfield, Missouri. It didn't start in St. Louis, where all the Pentecostal headquarters, man. <laughs> no, in Jerusalem. Now, now watch this. For the first 30 or 40 years of the brand new church, they were basically Christian. Now, there were some household of Cornelius uh, in Acts chapter 10 received the Holy Ghost and they were baptized. But basically, the church was in Israel until, uh, the, the, until the disciples were scattered throughout the world. Right. Now, the further the church moved away from Jerusalem into the Mediterranean Valley around Rome, uh, Greece, and Italy. The more the church became Mediterranean, which was Gentile, the Gentiles have, have eternally been anti-Semitic. And so even though many of the Gentiles in the Mediterranean Valley were accepting the Christian message. They were not accepting the Judaic, the Judaic flavor of Christianity. Right. And the further the church got away from Israel and the one God philosophy, the one God faith, and it got mixed in with the with the Greco-Roman uh, uh, false religions, Zeus, Diana, uh, Hercules, uh, all of those Greek gods, the Gentiles who accepted Christ were rejecting the Jewish element of Christianity. And so that's where I believe that the authentic Christian church 
that began on the day of Pentecost, as it grew and developed, it was never Roman Catholic, it was never Lutheran, it was never Baptist, it was never Anglican. It has always remained true to the message of Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38. Right. It's, the true church has always been a one God believing church. Yes. And the Trinitarian era that came in around the third century. Actually, that was 150. When Tertullian introduced the, the letters, it was okay. 150 AD. Okay. But it really began to, it was, it, that's when it was impregnated. Right. But it grew until about the third century because it was in 313 AD Constantine. when Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, which made Christianity equal with all the other religions in the Roman Empire. But it was not until 323 and 324 with the Council of Nicaea right. that they codified under Constantine. There were 324 bishops from all over the uh, Roman Empire. It was in 320 at the Council of Nicaea where they codified the Trinitarian belief right. and a lot of the other extra biblical. And then it took the next 1,000 years of what uh, secular history calls the Dark Ages. Right. The Roman Church calls them the Golden Age because that's when they assumed authority right. in Europe. And then it was in 1056 that that there was a dispute <coughs> between the Eastern Church and the Western Church over whether the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son or whether the Holy Spirit proceeds only from the Father. And that's when the great schism took place in 1056. And the Orthodox, Roman or the Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Romanian Orthodox, Bulgaria, the five Orthodox churches that comprise what we call the Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, Church broke from the Pope in Rome. And so we have the Eastern Orthodox Church, which is all Russia and those countries. And then we have the Roman Catholic Church, which dominated Western Europe, and then later uh, through, uh, through uh, colonization, Rome sent their missionaries to Central and South America. They tried to Catholicize America, but fortunately we had enough people coming over from uh, England and, and uh, 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 Switzerland, France enough, and yeah, yeah. enough Anabaptist people came over who were anti-Catholic right. and they came over about the only Catholics that came over in the early days settled up in Rhode Island. And Rhode Island, at the time that America became a nation, Rhode Island was basically Roman Catholic, but the, the rest of the nation became more Anabaptist than, than uh, anything. And then of course at the turn of the 19, uh, 1900, with, a, with the modern outpouring of the Holy Spirit is when the Pentecostal movement began in earnest. Now, there have always been people since the day of Pentecost for the last 2,000 years, there have always been people in the earth speaking in tongues because we were never a part of the Catholic Church and then the Reformation when Luther and all that bunch broke. Right. Uh, in, in what? For, I forget the date now. I got so many dates in my head, but uh, I could probably just give the average person my social security number if they think that was the date. <laughs> But, uh, uh, but just here's one thing we need to understand. And for the apostolics listening to us anywhere in the world, just know that the true apostolic church was never a part of the Roman church. No. They broke away from us. We didn't break away from them. Yeah. We were never a part of them. Right. And, in, and from the Council of Nicaea, that's where I, I call that the great detour. That's when the Trinitarian doctrine that was impregnated in 19, uh, in 150 by Tertullian. Right. Now Constantine has, has fed it along with all these bishops. There was a handful of bishops that rejected the Nicene Council and Constantine just excommunicated them, so to speak. But here, here I, want to, I want to interject this in here uh, uh, and I think it's a very important point. Uh, first of all, uh, because we have never swayed as apostolics from the truth, okay? 
there were those who were who were uh, um, um, saved or or they, they switched sides or proselyted. Uh, um, um, in other words, there were Roman people who came to understand that the apostolic was the truth. But when they came to the apostolic understanding, they brought with them some of their traditions. Yes. Okay. Which infected what we have today as the apostolic church. We have taken on still some of those traditions. Those are the ones I fight against. Those are the ones I argue against. We've taken on some of those traditions and made them our own when they really have nothing to do with the truth of Christ Jesus who dwells inside of us. Now I drew this little drawing here. I know that, that you probably can't see it. Uh, on the, no, you can't see it. But up here, it's, a, it's the, uh, uh, F, or the uh, Trinitarian. Let me hold it up here. Yeah, the Trinitarian, I want her to see it first. The Trinitarian belief system, okay? Right. Now you saw up on the on the, on the uh, left hand side you saw the Father. On the right hand side you saw the Holy Spirit. On the bottom you saw Jesus. Okay, and in the center you saw God. Okay, now the Trinitar Trinitarians believe that God the Father cannot be God the Son. Mm -hmm. They also believe that God the Father cannot be God the Holy Spirit. Just as just as same thing as the Holy Spirit cannot be God the Holy Spirit cannot be God the Son. That they they cannot be the same. But they're still God. And God's in the center of it all. We believe we take away all of that, and we believe that you cannot separate God. You do not divide God. What you have is you have the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as the bishop described, okay? And so Jesus, that's good, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm busy, I'm sorry, thank you. Jesus is God. He cannot be separated. He's also the Father. Turn to, to uh, Isaiah 9, 6. Yeah. Isaiah 9, 6. And then I'll ask okay, Lori, read it then, please. She gets there. I'm there. All right, wonderful. Okay. Now you should highlight this. You should underline. You should, um, we got a highlighter. You want a yellow highlighter? Yeah, it's right here. Oh, okay. This should be marked in your Bible. It should be all. It should be all, almost when you almost memorize. So this is the birth of the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. For unto us as for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Okay. So who is he? He's God. He's he's the everlasting father, he's the Prince of Peace. Right. Notice the word name is singular. Singular name. And yet there's a whole list of names. Right. But but his name is a singular name. Yes. These are all attributes of who he is. Right. These tell us who he is. Exactly it. But he only has one name. He only has one name. But he cannot be separated from that name. Exactly. Okay. That's why this scripture is so important. In the, in the NASB it says... For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or his peace. On the throne of David, or over and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with it with justice and with righteousness from then on and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this it watches verse 6 read the uh, and his name will be called 
and his name will be called. Okay, in this uh, Aramaic Bible, it says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name is called. Okay. So that makes it... Even more de definitive. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> even before the son was given, he had a name. Right. And in the King James, like, like she read it, his name shall be called... His name shall be called. Right. Okay, I like the way I like that says this, it. And his name is. He's is. already called that. Yeah, yeah. Not he will be yeah. called. His name is already called. Because you know why he's called that? Because he was what crucified before the foundation yes. of the world. Yes. The crucifixion didn't take God by surprise. No. He, no. It was a plan. Yeah. There's no. There's no man alive that could put Christ on the cross unless he unless he said he was going to go. Amen. Questions. Think you got it? Amen. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 8 6. Evelyn, would you please the last little bit of it? Yes, as soon as I put this fish. Yep, that's fine. 1 Corinthians 8 6. Now, I like the way King James says it, but I also like the way the NASB says it. Okay? Yeah, just the last of it. Only a little bit. Anybody else while I'm up? I'm good, thank you. I'm okay. Yet for us, there is but one God. Okay? In the King James, but to us, there is but one God. The Father, for whom all things, and, yeah, excuse me, from whom all things, and we exist for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom we are all things, and we exist through him. Now, the King James says basically the same thing. I mean, it always does. I mean, it's not going to change. It's just the way it works. But to us there was one God, the Father of whom all things, we, and we in him, okay, we in him, not for him. That's the difference there. We in him, okay, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all are all things, we are by him. Amen. Thank you so much. There wasn't very much left. <laughs> That's good. Go to John 1. Very familiar scripture to all the people. In this. And we're going to probably finish off with this one here because there's so much in here. One one? One one, yes. That's the wrong Bible there. Hallelujah. I got to turn there too. Amen. Alright. Amen. In the beginning, God is omnipresent. He sits outside of time, like Bishop said. He is in the present, and he's also in our future, all at the same moment. In the beginning was the word. That would be another scripture after this one. <laughs> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God. All things, okay? See, there's no separation. It doesn't say there's multiple gods, it's just one God. It says He's there with God, all right? That He is God. Nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was the life. Okay, in him was the life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This is the issue that we're having throughout the world today, that all these people who profess their religions, they profess their faith, they profess all, all their deities and all of these things, they are walking in the darkness. They have no light of understanding. All right? In the beginning was the Word. 
in the beginning we considered Jesus the Word. So in the beginning was Jesus. And the Jesus, okay, was with God. And Jesus was God. Now, it says in, don't turn here, Philippians 2, 6, it says, whom throughout, okay, excuse me, whom, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Okay? He didn't make a big deal of it by pronouncing, first of all, hey, here I am, I'm God, you got to get all this going, okay? He didn't, he didn't make a boasting of it. What he did was every so often, in a very suddenly, he told them that I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Mm -hmm. Okay? That he always existed. And there was no time or any place that has not had time or any, anything inside of time or outside of time that he was not existing in. Because he's God. And turn to the final, final verse to... to um, oh, and of course... Verse 14, you should highlight that one too, down there, while you're, while you're going through, real quick. Verse 14. Verse 14. Drop down verse 14. 14 is in chapter 2. There's another 14 in John 1. <laughs> you're ready to do my Bible? Yeah. What happened to your Bible? I don't know. It stops at 9 or 10. Are you in 1st John or John? Oops, who's in? This is John. This is what he just read. Let's see. Just one more, please. Oh, no, 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 no. You're in 1 John. That's why. Did I have the wrong thing right there? You had the wrong thing right there? Yes. Oh. Let me hear you. Try to read sideways a little bit here. Good job. Okay. You want to highlight those one, three, one through three or five, whatever okay. you want to choose there, okay? All right. All right. No, no. Wow. That's why we have Bible study. You've got to ask questions. Wait a minute. Mine says this. Okay, so you've got to make it known that, you know, if, if, if I'm out of the wrong place or you're in the wrong place, um, you know, because you guys have been with me for Bible study, sometimes I go in the wrong place. All right? Then you drop down to 14 and mark that one for yourself. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, so here we have in the beginning, right? All right? Was the word, and the word was with God, right? All right, now we go to Genesis 1. Genesis 1? Genesis 1, the last one. Genesis 1. 1. 1, 1. Here is, in Genesis 1-1, is where some people get confused because of the wording that comes later on here. But we'll take time to talk about that. We have about five minutes here left. It says here in 1-1, in the beginning, God. Okay? That's who we serve, God. Created the heaven and the earth. It didn't say gods. Okay? It said God. I want to make a point of that. It doesn't say gods. It says God. And the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the earth, the face of the deep. And the spirit, okay, you might want to underline it or mark it, okay? And the spirit, Right, capital S. 
So it's only talking about the Holy Spirit, it's capital S. Okay? So what is, who is, what is God? The Spirit. He's the Spirit, okay? And the Spirit of God, not God's, Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And the God and God said, so in 1 John, you read, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? So when you read this in verse 3 right here, it says, and God said, that means the Word was spoken. He being the word, it was spoken. Let there be light. And there was light. Okay? So we have before us one God revealing his spirit and revealing the word to us. All the same moment. Okay? Not God's, just God. Any questions? Because you, you can ask. Amen. Okay, so in verse, same chapter, verse 26. Same chapter. Verse 26. This is where people get confused. Now, as Bishop pointed out, and I point out several times, that God is omnipresent, omnipresent, okay? There's nothing he does not know. There's no time period that he does not dwell in, okay? So when he's speaking outside of time, he's speaking into time. When he's speaking into time, he's speaking from a perspective of looking here, looking backwards. Okay? He's looking here and looking backwards. So it says here, and God said, let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, et cetera, et cetera, and follow the air and over the cattle and over the and all over all the earth and and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Right? People will take that and say, no, look at this is the Trin Tr Trinitarian God that we're that we're that we need to worship. Because they have a lack of understanding of the omnipresence of God. He sits outside of time, therefore he's not restricted to time. And because he's not restricted to time, he already sees who we are, what's, what, what's going to happen. He sees us as a multitude. And he also sees us as one. So he speaks from the, from the platform of being God over everything. So when he speaks, he's speaking into time. And the time that he sees has already been done. It's a finished work. So when he says here, and God said, let us make man... If they want to write it that way and interpret that, it that way, and if the scrolls are broken down and, and, and the parchments are broken down, and that's what it says, he is still omnipresent. He's speaking from the future, knowing everything already. Now, there are people who believe that there was angels were created first, right? And if angels were created first, then who is he speaking to then? If you look at it that way, Angels are what? Ministering what? Spirits. Ministering spirits. Okay, we were created as what? A little lower than those ministering spirits. So he very well also could have been speaking to the angels. Because he's a spirit. They are spirits. But I don't see a third god or three gods here. I don't see it. Most apostolic theologians take the word us where it says then God said let us make man in our image 
King James, this, that's out of the King James Version. Now, that's what it says here in the Aramaic Version. But King James was a British monarch speaking in British English. Mm -hmm. And when a British monarch was addressing a situation, they never referred to themselves in, in a personal pronoun. If when Queen Elizabeth was alive, if she would have come to America to visit, and she stood before our Senate and our Congress, she would not say, I, Queen Elizabeth, am glad to be here with you. She would say, we are glad to be here with you. She's speaking in the language of the royals. And I believe that here, that God is speaking in the language of royalty because he is the royal. Okay. So he says, let us. now. The other, the other uh, theory. Uh, the other theory is that he was referring to angels, right? And that he, and I like what you said. He's speaking. He's present, but he's speaking from the future. Let us maybe meaning the the population of heaven. Let us make man after our own image. Or right. something like that. I choose personally. It makes me. I'm convinced. I'm satisfied to use the the. Interpretation that says that God is speaking in, in the language of the royals. That, right. I'm, I'm happy with that. Right. I can and it's the part. Yeah. Yes. There, there's also right. in Genesis 11 7, in Genesis 11 7 says, Come, let us go down, mm -hmm. all right, and they're confused in their languages so that they will not understand one another and speak. Now, speaking from a royalty position, God is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So what he does is he commands. Okay? So when he tells the angels to go down and scatter them. Right, I believe that. Okay? Yeah. He's speaking to them from a place of authority and power, saying, okay, let us go down. So in other words, you're going in my name or in my power, and you're going to do what I told you to do, and you're going to separate them from ba in Babylon. You're going to separate them so that they can't be of one language and build this tower up to me that they think they are gods themselves. So when we see the plurality, plurality, I think that's the right word, pluralism of speech or language, come let us, we have to look at it from a place of authority. When you tell your children something, okay, in the past, when you, when you told them you were raising them up, you spoke out of your authority to go have them do something. Now your language didn't say us, okay? Sometimes maybe it did include us as, as part of the language, but you spoke from a place of authority as a parent telling them what they needed to do and they went and did it, hopefully, so sometimes, once in a great while. Sometimes they would listen to you, sometimes it would be done, you know, okay, all that. But you see, that's the same, same way that God speaks. He's staying looking. Look at you! You you are part of me. You I have created you. So when I say for for you to go, I'm telling all of you. Let's us let's, let's go down there. And I'm with my word. I am telling you, you have authority to do what I've told you to do. Right? That's how basically how he looks at her. I think and how I look at it. Um, so he told you he commanded his angels to break it up. Go break up that fight or go create a fight. <laughs> <laughs> go whatever you gotta do. Yeah, you know, go ahead, sir. Just a quick observation. Sure. That doesn't require a response. Oh my God. But I, it does it's require. It does not require a response. Oh, but God, who sees and knows everything, why did He have to come down to Babel? Oh, I got one better. I got one better. He's never come down to Earth until Jesus. Mm -hmm. Show me in the Bible. Where God came down to earth, stood on stood on, on earth as God. And Who, well, I agree. Who walked with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? In the Garden, but we don't know for sure the Garden was in because remember that that in in the Genesis as we, as we discussed, okay, it says that He took Adam out from and put him into the Garden. We don't know. We have a, an idea of where the Garden is. But we don't know exactly where it's at. No one's ever seen it. No one ever knows. 
because there's an angel, the cherubim guarding it. Okay, so God walks with Adam in the cool of the day in the garden, not on the earth. Well, God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Yes, but where is it? <laughs> well, <laughs> modern archaeologists say that the original Garden of Eden is in modern day Iraq. Right. I mean, I don't. Right. That, that's what. That's, that's what they say. Yes. Archaeologists say. Yes. Genesis eleven five. Uh huh. Says, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. Right. That's what I just. Did. Okay. But he came down. came down. It didn't say that he touched the earth. It didn't say he walked on the earth. He came down. He looked down upon what was being done, knowing what was being done, I said and passed mean, judgment on it. Yeah, my statement didn't require a response. I just said yeah. that. Well, <laughs> I found it to be interesting that God, the Lord came down when he could have stayed in heaven and just looked and looked. Uh, but I don't care whether he came down or not. You know, he said to show you in the Bible, so. <laughs> right. Yeah, but did, did, it, did it say he walked on the earth? He didn't say he did. Well, it didn't say he didn't, right. But I do believe that greater than, you know, they often say the greatest thing that ever happened was when man walked on the moon. No, no, the greatest thing that ever happened was, was when God walked on the earth right. in the person of Jesus Christ. Right. And what if the interpretation, now we're, now we're just being hypothetical here, what if the interpretation was that he looked down, he looked down upon the earth? Well, the, with the King James, which is almost irrefutable. So <laughs> he, he came, came down. down. He came down. So he came down. What verse did you see? What, what verse? 11 5. Genesis 11 5. Yeah. You see? That's what it says in the, in the original one, which is. That's a week, yeah. Yes. In, the, in the Aramaic, which is the language Jesus spoke. Exactly. Verse 5, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which men were building. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And they have reasoned to do these things, and now nothing will prevent them from doing that which they have imagined to do. So come, or rather come, let us go down there and divide their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from the from there up on the face of all the earth, and they ceased from building the city. And by afternoon, God was walking and putting his right foot in front of his left foot as he walked down the road.